So Akila has responded to the court suggesting that she shouldn't pay the fees to Sargon of Akkad. And of course, Sargon has responded as well. I've summarized both of those documents to their really important arguments, and I'm going to show them to you in just a second. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I'm your host, Nick Riccada of Riccada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. And uh, today, today I've got uh, to show you the arguments between Sargon of Akkad and Akila, obviously, over the fee award. Now, if you don't know about this, Akila sued Sargon back in 2017. I've done a couple videos on it very recently because Sargon finally won that case on a motion to dismiss. Um, it sat around for almost two years with basically nothing happening, and now Sargon has won and is arguing that his legal fees should be paid. Akila has responded to that argument, and Sargon has responded to her response. So we're going to take a look at those documents real quick. I've highlighted the relevant, important arguments from both sides, and let's just say Akila's argument that she shouldn't be paying fees is a little limp. Okay, so uh, stick with me here. If you like these quick update videos and short legal explanations about what's going on, go ahead, like, follow, subscribe, all of that stuff. And uh, if you want to get more in-depth teardowns into legal topics or just me drinking whiskey and complaining about things, uh, come watch a live stream, usually every weeknight at 11 p.m. All right, here we go. Here is Leah, uh, Akila, Akila Hughes's... Um, response to Sargon's memorandum of law in support of his fees. This is her memorandum of law in opposition to the fees. So her attorney is Kristen Grant. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to go through the summary of the case or the standard because you can see these in the other video and it will just save time. Here are her arguments, and this is what's important. Uh, first, she says her litigation conduct was reasonable and her motivations were in good faith. And she cites this case, Kurtzang here, which we're going to get to. Remember Kurtzang when we get to Sargon's uh, response, because his lawyer thoroughly dissects uh, Akila's lawyer's use of these various cases and talks about why the use is improper and not actually in support of what she's claiming. Now, this is, it doesn't necessarily mean that she can't use these cases in support. It's just, in my opinion, the argument on uh, coming from Sargon's attorney is more well-founded than this one. So let's take a look. Uh, she cites Kurtzang here and says, in cases where a good faith claim has been brought and lost, an award of attorney's fees may repress the purpose of the Copyright Act. This is especially true in the application of doctrines that are not clear cut, but require a case by case analysis. Now, case by case analysis is required for any sort of uh, fair use. Fair use is by definition, a case-by-case -case basis. There is no bright line rule on fair use. So they're attempting to use this sort of argument that because it's case-by-case, -case, then uh, it's, it's not so obvious. No one knows whether or not you're going to win a fair use case. Now, that's true in the literal sense of you never know if you're going to win or lose a case. Uh, there's always some weird thing that could happen. Um, something could go wrong. A judge could be brain dead. A whole bunch of stuff could happen. But in this case, pretty much everybody could figure out that Sargon was going to win it. There wasn't a lot of question over what he did being transformative or fair use. And there were a lot of problems with the lawsuit that Akila brought. Plaintiff commenced this action for copyright infringement with a good faith belief that defendants copying and uploading of, quote, wholesale reproductions of plaintiff's original content and adding a title was insufficient to amount to fair use. Now, this argument is a little disingenuous because it wasn't a wholesale reproduction. Sargon actually edited it down pretty severely, and that's something that the judge focused on heavily in his opinion. This argument is probably not going to get very far with the judge, because even the judge suggested that this looked like a pretty clear case of fair use at a pretrial hearing almost two years ago. So to still maintain 
that this was a good faith case and uh, and that it was it was based on some sort of belief that this was fair was not fair use is going to be a problem. And she actually includes her declaration here, which I think is a big mistake. Let's take a look at why. I've got it right here. Here's her declaration. Now, it just cites uh, to exhibit A and B and says they're true and correct. So these are email exchanges between Aquila and Sargon. And then exhibit B are recent comments from her video, which we'll get uh, up to in just a minute. This is a mistake because this email exchange, in my opinion, shows Sargon being really, really reasonable about this and Aquila just being completely dense, right? And, and that is not the best, it's not the best evidence that you brought it in good faith because Sargon actually flat, here, well, let's just read it. Hi, Aquila. Is there any reason you've leveled a false copyright strike against me? Do you understand that under fair use, I can use copyrighted work in a transformative manner for parody or satire? I'll naturally be contesting your claim and I will win. I've been through this process with YouTube many times now. So I'm sending you this email as a polite way of seeing if we can discuss the issue. Cheers. Like Sargon, that is a, an absurdly polite email, right? And Aquila uh, comes back with something. It's kind of hard because the, uh, I think these are in backwards order as they usually are on this stuff. Um, yeah, you can see uh, the timestamps are, are kind of backwards, but she doesn't have all of the responses in there, which is a little annoying, but we do see your comedian. Can you honestly not see how my video was satirical? And then, uh, hi, Akila, I'm sorry to tell you this, but editing is a transformative process and can indeed be used for satire slash parody. I'd recommend speaking to Jonathan McIntosh to get more information. You can contact him at Radical Bytes. It'll help you understand the nuance of the issue. It's not, it's simply not true that a two minute remix of your video constitutes direct replication of copyright material. So here's Sargon laying this out pretty clearly for her and again, politely and offering to resolve the issue before this even became a lawsuit. Uh, YouTube will reinstate it as I'm within bounds of U.S. law. I'm happy you re reported me as this will help hasten the process. So then she says satire parody requires a commentary on the original work. Putting SJW in the title is not fair use or commentary. YouTube won't be reinstating it. None of these are actually true statements, which she says here. Uh, satire parody does not require commentary on the original work. Uh, it just has to reflect a critical nature of the original work. But there isn't a requirement that commentary uh, be actually put to it. And the judge clearly disagrees with this assessment. Now, in fairness, she might have believed this early on, but upon researching the subject, uh, she and her counsel should have figured out that this was going to be fair use, right? That's, that's the idea. But again, here you have uh, Carl being relatively polite but assertive that he would win and that this would go in his favor, which was correct. And Aquila uh, being rather obstinate about it. And it, I don't know about the, the fair use portions. So she's, uh, he says, the comments on that video were satirical themselves in total recognition of the satirical nature of the video. Also, there were no comments calling you a she boon or porch monkey or anything of the like, at least not that I saw. The YouTube comment filter automatically screened such things. And if it didn't, I removed them personally. Now, I don't know what he's responding to. She, com she attached an incomplete email chain here, which is frustrating. The judge, judges want, like you and I, would want to know what else is in this email change. What exchange? What is she? What is she doing? But again, here's Sargon saying, look, if someone uses some sort of racial epithet, I'm actually going out and removing those from the comments because uh, that's not what this is for. Plus, YouTube has systems for that. Everybody watching this video realizes that it's satire. And then she says, look at the comments on your video. No one thinks it's satire. You know why? There's no commentary. If you think there is, please tell me what co that commentary is. There's nothing there. Clearly not understanding that the video itself, the editing of the video, the title, and uh, all of that was the commentary. Like that was the critical nature of, of the work. Okay, back to it. Plaintiff litigated her claims reasonably, 
Prior to filing of defendant's motion to dismiss, plaintiffs sought to settle this matter by providing defendant with an initial settlement offer while remaining open to settlement discussions. Yet again, this argument rings hollow. She asked for 40, something like $46,000 to settle the lawsuit that ended up costing Sargon about $33,000 to resolve. So that is a lot of money. Plus, a lot of people were telling her that this was fair use. Plus, she can't support that she was going to actually lose any money on this case or lose any any revenue. She hadn't registered the copyright, so she wasn't entitled to statutory damages under the law. Any amounts that she would receive would be compensation for actual lost revenue and nothing more. And it's hard to suggest that she was going to get anywhere near $45,000 of revenue for her video. So even assuming Sargon copied her work verbatim and re-uploaded it, there's no way that her $44,000 amount was anywhere near the ballpark of what she was likely to lose due to the infringing nature of the work. This is a big problem with saying that that argument or that that offer had anything reasonable associated with it at all. So next, this is the best argument it's not a great argument but it's the best argument in here in my opinion i don't know why she has it second i would have put it first um and it's it's something that we're going to see more and more of as gofundmes are used to fund lawsuits uh more and more frequently but it says the defendant has already been compensated adequately for uh the case and that's because Sargon raised a whole boatload of money on GoFundMe to go ahead and deal with this case. He raised about 122,000 uh, US dollars. He's got it in, in uh, British money, so who knows, you know, but they converted it here. It's about 122,000 US dollars. And, you know, they say he incurred attorney's fees of about 33,500 plus an additional 5,000 for the motion. So about 38 grand. So after all that, Sargon stands to gain $83,365, right? He's, he's pulling in a lot of money as a result of this. And so she's arguing that because of that, she shouldn't have to pay fees. There's one big problem with this. And the big problem with this is that third party actions have nothing to do with the deterrent nature of the fee award. The attorney's fees award going from the from the wrong party to the correct party are compensatory for the fees paid, but they're also to deter a bad faith. Uh, they're to deter bad faith behavior. That's the point of the fee. It's to stop them from doing this again in the future. So frivolously, right? Well, someone else giving Sargon money has nothing to do with whether or not this deters Aquila's uh, actions. That's why this ends up being a pretty poor argument. Although, I, like I said, I do think it is the best argument because the judge is going to look at this and just from a person perspective say, he made $83,000 off of this. Now, I don't know if Sargon kept the money. I don't know if he donated it to UKIP. I don't know if he uh, saved a puppy orphanage. Who knows? Doesn't really matter what he did with that money. What does matter, though, is... Uh, it's it's not going to deter Aquila if the judge takes that into con uh, consideration and doesn't award the attorney's fees to Sargon. And but again, it's the psychological aspect. The judge goes, man, he just he just got a lot of money on this. Does he need to get more? Yes, probably. He shouldn't have had to go through this at all. Uh, so here's her last argument. It's that the the fees would not increase the deterrent effect. And she says, in summary, plaintiff has faced widespread public criticism as a result of losing this lawsuit. Thus, an award of an attorney's fees uh, will only be additional and unjust punishment for a good faith attempt to enforce her rights. And again, she has included the comments. And these comments are from recently. These are new comments. Uh... Let's see. Some people own it when they're wrong. Some people lie and pretend it isn't happening. Personally, I prefer it when they shut up shop and never come back. How does it feel to be wrong about your whole life? I think everyone just came to point and laugh at the village fool. Uh, they, what they're doing here is talking about, you know, loses lawsuit. These are results of losing the lawsuit. That's not a deterrent to bringing the lawsuit, right? These are just 
YouTube trolls. And that's not my words, but that's how a lot of YouTube creators would consider detractors. Like, okay, Sargon's fans came and trolled me. Is this the general public? No information is provided to suggest that these people are are somehow uh, uniquely situ or ununiquely situated as just members of the general populace coming in and looking at what happened and then making these things. These are likely Sargon viewers, of which he has uh, several hundred thousand subscribers. I think something like 900,000 subscribers. There's a lot of people to draw upon to make these sort of things. Uh, it's a shame you won't be able to spend Sargon's money on your black supremacist groups. Maybe you should give some of your own money to your racist groups and stop trying to sue people and wasting the court's time. She is getting some criticism here. You'll always be known as that SJW tried to shut down someone else's voice through the courts. So she's included these comments, but they're not likely to be very persuasive. And again, it's something that Carl has no control over and has no benefit from it. He's not compensated by her getting ridiculed. He would be compensated by an award of attorney's fees. Attorney's fees he shouldn't have had to spend. No matter where they came from, it doesn't really matter that a bunch of people came together and gave Sargon money to do the lawsuit. He shouldn't have had to spend that money on a lawsuit. That's money that he could have, in theory, gotten through some other marketing effort. Like maybe he could have put out other video content, or maybe he could have created something that those people could have contributed to. Maybe he could have uh, made a comic book or a movie or a video game. I think, isn't he working on something like that? I don't remember. Anyway, let's get to Sargon's responses real quick. Uh, plaintiff's claims were un objectively unreasonable because the fair use defense clearly applies based on the face of the complaint. Now, he is citing the opinion of the judge who is hearing the fee arguments here. That's the fair use defense clearly applies based on the face of the complaint. The judge said that, and that's on the face of the complaint. So on the face of the document that Aquila's counsel submitted for her, that Aquila signs off on, the fair use clearly applies based on that. So you should have known from your own pleading that fair use applied, is what the judge says. So objective, saying it's objectively unreasonable, objective unreasonableness carries substantial weight when awarding fees under section 505. And he cites Kurt saying here. Now, this is interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll get to the we'll get to the interesting aspect of it in a minute, but here we go. Um, the opposition responds that plaintiff sued upon guidance of her formal counsel and with a subjective good faith belief that her claims had merit. But those arguments are misplaced because Fogarty and Kurtzang, uh, this is what I was talking about, prescribes an objective test, not a subjective one. So in this in the uh, citation that Aquila's counsel used before, the test is objective reasonableness not subjective reasonableness, not do you believe whether or not it was reasonable, but is it reasonable objectively? Do you believe you're justified in bringing the claim is irrelevant to that test? It's would any reasonable person find it objectively reasonable to bring it? So then uh, the quote from Mallory versus NBC Universal says, finding that where copyright claims are objectively unreasonable, plaintiffs profess subjective belief to the contrary is entitled to no weight. So this is a problem for Aquila, is that uh, Kurt Sang applies an objective test that is objectively unreasonable because the court found that even on the face of the complaint itself, you could tell it was fair use. So the opposition also argues that plaintiffs should not pay because fair use ordinarily requires case-by-case -case analysis. But in the exceptional case like this one, where it is clear from the face of the complaint that a defendant copied for the transformative purposes of criticism and commentary, pursuit of an infringement claim is unreasonable, speech chilling, and contrary to the purposes of the Copyright Act. Now here again, he's citing to the opinion. And this is a good move, right? Hit the judge with his own words. Next, they're addressing, uh, Akila said that she tried to settle it, right? We talked about that a little bit ago. Defendant made early efforts to settle, and then he includes his letter. We're not going to go through this letter, but there's not really anything about settling in this letter. It basically says, you're stupid to try this. Don't try it. If you do try it, 
we're going to go after costs and fees. Here are the reasons that you're stupid for trying this. It's laid out very well in the letter, but I, I don't know if I'd classify it as a settle, uh, settlement from that letter. What they should have done was cited these emails that are in here where Sargon made attempts to settle this before it even got here and tried to reasonably explain to her uh, his position and asked if they could talk about it and work it out. But he did promise to seek fees when plaintiff ignored him. Plaintiff's improper motivation merits fees. The plaintiff's motivations were improper because she used the lawsuit to silence criticism for self-promotion and to leverage a settlement of meritless claims. Now they're citing to their initial motion here. Years of public taunts prove plaintiff's purpose. Uh, purposes. They're citing to their motion and pointing out that they don't even address this stuff directly in the uh, in the response. They kind of generally hand wave it away, but that's not very good. The opposition hardly denies it. Instead, citing no authority, it asserts that plaintiff's conduct is irrelevant, which they go ahead and bring in uh, Fort Gang and says, that uh, the circumstantial evidence that a copyright claim, claim was not brought because of it in, its inherent merit is properly considered on a motion for fees under Section 505. So it definitely is relevant. Here's evidence, and they should have rebutted it. That's what this is saying. They didn't even bother. They didn't even bother. They just, they just said, no, doesn't matter. The opposition also attempts to minimize plaintiff's conduct as heat of the moment banter between plaintiff and defendant that rings hollow because plaintiff has been caught up in the heat of the moment for better part of two years and basically says Sargon was just going ahead through the lawsuit, wasn't really bantering back and forth. And again, those emails, I wish they would have cited those emails. Sargon wasn't bantering in those emails. He was very reasonably and politely laying out to her the problems with her case. The opposition argues that Section 505 should not apply because Sargon earned a surplus. So this is addressing the GoFundMe after plaintiff sued him. But it offers no reason fees should be reduced by collateral source payments. And this has long been uh, part, of, part of this back and forth argument because GoFundMe is kind of new, but people paying for other people's lawsuits is not kind of new. But the idea that you shouldn't get money because someone else helped you pay is is a little bit ridiculous because that person shouldn't have had to help you pay either. And if you happen to get more than what that person gave you because they, they like you and they just want to donate money to you, what, what does that have to do with the fee award? Nothing. Nothing at all. Its sole case highlights how compensation is served by awarding fees to prevailing copyright defendants who, like Sargon, are not entitled to compensatory damages. So uh, they cited the NFL versus Primetime 24 joint venture, declining to award fees where plaintiff was appropriately compensated by a $2.5 million damage award that serves as sufficient deterrence. So in the other case, they, were, they uh, received compensatory damages in two and a half, for $2.5 million. So the court didn't award fees on top of the $2.5 million. But in this case, Sargon isn't entitled to any damages. The fees are the damages that he suffered. That is where it actually hurt Sargon, and that would be Akilah's goal. Cost Sargon money in bringing the lawsuit. So, if he's not awarded to some compensatory damages, they're saying that he should get fees. In sum, adopting the opposition's logic would arbitrarily relieve unreasonable, improperly motivated actors of accountability based on third-party conduct. So, just because someone else decides of their own free will to give money to someone, the the person who did the bad thing shouldn't have to pay that's the that's the question here and that that doesn't sound like justice the opposition argues in effect that plaintiff has so dearly suffered by way of widespread public criticism that an award of fees will have no further deterrent effect but the criticism is not punishment again they're relying entirely on third party actors it is an earned result of plaintiff's unreasonable conduct so they're saying that this isn't punishment. This is just how the how the populace at large is going to react to something like this. And then finally, uh, they argue that it is entirely conceivable that the widespread criticism plaintiff claims to have borne as a result of her lawsuit will re redound to her financial benefit in the form of likes, subscription, followers, and royalties. No bad, no publicity is bad publicity, right? Uh, or no bad publicity is bad publicity. It's this could end up benefiting Aquila in the long run, re-energizing her supporters, and, uh, and putting out into the media this thing that she's involved in and drawing people to her side. There's a lot of people who don't like Sargon who might want to pick up 
her channel or something. Who knows? But uh, the main point here goes back to that this isn't Sargon doing anything. These are other people reacting and her claiming that that is uh, punishment that should somehow compensate Sargon for his losses. Uh, plaintiff does not claim inability to pay because the opposition does not aver that plaintiff lacks resources or argue a disparity in the party's financial circumstances. A reduction in the award of fees would be inappropriate. So then they, they have some citations here. She doesn't ever say that she's not able to pay. She just says she doesn't want to because people have been mean to her in a comment section on one video. And that's an important point too. The sole evidence she has asserting that she's uh, received significant ridicule is approximately 40 comments from two screenshots from one video that she made. That's sufficient public criticism to deter her from filing another lawsuit. She got a ton of interactivity on the, in her comment section on a video. It probably got a bunch of views that she wouldn't otherwise get. Heck, 700 people liked some of those comments. Those 700 views probably would never manifest on an Aquila the Obviously's video because they're probably from Sargon followers or at least people sympathetic to Sargon's position. So uh, then they go ahead and, and reinstate the reasonableness request. Now, what do I think? I think the judge is going to award some fees to Sargon. I think he will likely give a haircut uh, to it. They have some discretionary tools usually in their in their uh, tool set to reduce the overall amount of fees. And the big reason is going to be because Sargon did get a bunch of money. But this was a really frivolous lawsuit. So I could be completely wrong on that. I do think he's going to get something. I don't know if he's going to get the full amount. And if we're being honest, that's about the safest bet we can take here. That's the lawyer bet uh, that it's it's a pretty middle of the road sort of position. But I'm I'm anxious to see. Uh, who knows? We probably won't know for another month or so what the likely result will be. Maybe it could be, you know, it could be much longer. Uh, a month is about the soonest we'd see this. This was just filed yesterday. Well, yesterday for me on March 11th. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope this was informative for you. Again, if you like these kind of videos, hit like and subscribe and share them out. We'll see what happens. And uh, if you follow this channel, you'll find the fee result when it comes around. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you have a good day. Peace. Peace.